Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jean André. I'm in charge of the events for the Competence Center, Competence Center in Sustainability here at the University of Lausanne. And it will be my pleasure to be your co host today alongside my colleague Johan. Today, we have a very exciting program for you on a topic that you may have seen coming up increasingly at UNIL this past month the donut. Indeed, Jean André. It is an absolute pleasure and an honor to receive today the British economist Kate Rayworth, who created the original donut model in 2012 while working at Oxfam. Introduced in the lead up to the Rio Plus 20 summit, this initial proposition to bring together planetary boundaries with minimum social standards was able to influence both the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, which was already no small feat. In 2017, Kate authored the book Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, um, which expanded the concept into a full economic theory. Since then, she has been teaching at Oxford University as part of the Environmental Change Institute, and she's also been very active with DEAL, the Donuts Economic Action Lab, which supports public and private actors to foster ecological and social change. Thank you so much, Kate, for being with us today. How are you doing? Hi, I'm really well. I'm delighted to join you. I'm sitting here in my study at Oxford, very aware that I would much rather be in the room with you if that was possible, but I believe we can do a lot together online and I'm really committed to making this work well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us today. Before we dive uh, straight into your talk, let's take a quick look at today's program. Absolutely, Johan. So today, We'll, we'll start by giving the floor to Jacques Dubochet, our distinguished host of the series. He's not only our favorite Nobel laureate, but also a very active scientist and citizen who decided to use his platform to bring sustainability to the forefront of debates at UNIL. We will then turn our main screen and hear from Kate, live from Oxford, England. After her presentation, we will pass the microphone to our colleague Camille Gilots, who has been leading our work under the net for the Competence Center for Sustainability. And from theory to practice, we will see how this model was used to assess the sustainability of our institution, the University of Lausanne. She will then give the floor to Benoit Frain, our Vice Rector, Ecological Transition and Campus, who will offer a strategic outlook on how the donut is being used to guide the ecological and social transition of our academic institution. After this talk, we will have the pleasure of welcoming Julia Steinberger to lead the panel discussion. You probably know her as a professor of ecological economic here at UNIL, but she's also a lead author of the latest IPCC assessment report, specifically the third working group working on the mitigation of climate change. We will first take about 20 minutes of initial discussion between the panelists, and then we will open to questions from you, the audience. You can ask questions both in person during the time of the panel and online via the YouTube chat all throughout the conference. The event will come to a close around 2.45 p.m. Swiss time. And now, without further any ado, let's kick things off with Jacques Dubochet, our distinguished host of the series. Thank you, Jacques, for being with us today. We leave you the floor. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kate, for being here. Um, just after the Nobel Prize, University, Nuria Hernandez, uh, decided to offer this five conference uh, that with the title um, Envie d'agir, Decide to Act. The first two were Aurelia Barro, then um, <laughs> uh, Stéphane Foucault, and now uh, they were describing what is the situation, and now we have how do we get out of that? And uh, Kate has a recipe, so I propose uh, we let her to let her speak. <laughs> so 
So Kate, if you can hear us, you can start now your conference. Thank I you. can hear you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be invited here. Jacques, thank you so much for this lovely introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be invited by you into this space. And yes, I have something of a recipe that, of course, I have put together based on the work of many, many, many thinkers, drawing ingredients from many different places. But the ultimate test of a, of a recipe is what happens when you bake it. And that's why I'm so delighted to be contributing to this conversation today, because we're going to start with the bare elements of the recipe, the theory, and land in baking it into a donut for Unil itself. So let's see what happens. I'm going to share my screen with you because for me, images are incredibly important and powerful. They frame the way we see the world and what we see and what we don't see, what's centered and what's left off the screen. So I'm going to start with the 20th century concept of progress that we have all been born into this worldview, especially in countries of the global north. The idea that progress is endless growth, no matter how rich a nation already is. I say that sitting in the UK, talking to people in Switzerland, we are in two of the richest countries in the history of humanity, but if we listen to our politicians and indeed the economists who advise them, then the message is that the solution to our problems lies in yet more growth. And there has to be something ultimately insane in that recommendation. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life. I believe it's essential for low-income countries, but I believe it's an emergent property, not something that you pursue for its own sake and definitely not the ultimate measure of where we want to be. So I want to propose a very different starting point. And that is, of course, the donut, which I, I'm sure is familiar with all, if not many, already in the room. Think of it as a compass for 21st century thriving. Leave no one in the hole falling short on life's essentials, but don't overshoot the limits of the planet, these nine planetary boundaries. It is a minimal definition of ensuring that nobody is falling short on the most basic elements of life and that we don't overshoot the pressure points on planetary boundaries. Somewhere in that green space, we can find a future of thriving. If the goal is the donut, and it's a very, very different shape and sense of progress than endless growth, it's about thriving in balance. If that's the goal, we know that we are very far from this right now. As all the red in this image shows us, many millions, billions of people worldwide fall short on life's essentials, and we are overshooting at least six of the nine planetary boundaries. This is our collective selfie, our portrait that invites us, and that I think our grandchildren will question us, what did you do once that you knew? that this was the state of the world? How did it change the way you research and study and what you teach and the diagrams you draw and the worldview you pass on? How does it change the way you earn your living? How you invest and divest and protest and volunteer and vote? How does it shape the way you live in your home, how you heat your home, how you eat, what you think a good holiday is? Deeply transformative. This is a, an image of the donut at the global level. I want to bring it down first to the national level because we know that at the national level, far more policy is made specifically there. Here's just four nations across the world. You can see on the one hand, Malawi massive human shortfall without overshooting their share of planetary boundaries. China has a double whammy challenge, human shortfall and ecological overshoot. And the UK and the US even more so, both still have high levels of inequality within. You can see that red wedge of inequality inside, but massive ecological overshoot as incomes rise. And I should point out that the red overshoot is not measured on domestic resource use. It's measured on the consumption basis of a country's resource use. All of the materials, electronics, chemicals, foods, construction materials that are imported in order to create a good life where we are. So this work comes from Andrew Fanning, Dan O'Neill, Jason Hickel and others who have downscaled to the national scale. Let me then put that work in a scatter plot of around 50 nations from 150. And this place that every nation should be aiming for is that top left-hand corner. That's where we rise up 
to meet the needs of all people, but we do so coming back within the means of the living planet. If you're wondering where Switzerland is, I think it would be just about here if it was plotted on this. So the first thing we can notice is there's not a single country that we have data showing is living in the donut. And next time you find yourself or someone you know talking about developed countries, I would invite you to think again about what are we calling developed? Because I can't see a single country here that should be calling itself developed. There's nothing developed about overshooting planetary boundaries and undermining the life support systems of the planet and undermining therefore the opportunities of all other countries and people to have a chance to meet their needs in a stable climate with fertile soil and abundant biodiversity and a protective ozone layer. So let's also recognize these countries are profoundly interconnected. They're not separate dots on a scatter plot. They're interconnected by histories of colonialism all the way through to the current and future impacts of climate change. Interdependence because of the powers of the global north impacting predominantly upon the global south. So we need transformation within and between nations. Now let's go back to growth. The history of growth has broadly taken countries in this direction from a very low income like Malawi's. When you double that income per person in a country, of course it has often has transformative impacts on child survival, nutrition, women's education. It can be transformative. And as countries double that income, it you can see them rising up in human development. But instead of moving into the donut, the vast majority of countries just move straight past that point. And so we see the emergence of this red ecological overshoot in high income countries. So pursuing growth takes us straight past the sweet spot we need to get to. We need to do something radically different to move towards it. What if we could reorient and recluster these countries? So think about what I'll call the rise nations, low income countries today. How could they rise to meet the needs of their people without overshooting planetary boundaries as almost all countries before them have done? This is pretty much an unprecedented path. What would it take within those countries? What would it take from the world to make that possible? Middle income nations, instead of shooting straight past the donor as they lay down their infrastructures for transport, housing, energy, massive investments, are they taking them away from this sweet spot or can they be designed in a way that takes them towards it? This too is an unprecedented path. And then high income nations like yours and mine, a massive reduction in the ecological pressure on the planet while finally meeting the needs of all of their people because these nations certainly have the resources to do so. And then let's recognize that to achieve this will require a rebalancing internationally. Give meaning to that word rebalancing. Is it reparations? Is it redistribution of finance, of technology? Is it rebalancing of power in international financial and governmental institutions? Many, many forms of rebalancing, I believe, are needed to make all of this possible. So for me, this is like the uber map of directionality that we should be pursuing this century. And any policy local to global can be assessed in light of does it take us into this direction or not? What would it take to move us here? And I'm just going to focus our attention for a moment on the high income countries. And since I imagine this is a lively debate in your university, just point out that at this point, if you're a supporter of green growth or post growth or degrowth, I believe that people with these very different views at this point all want the same thing. They all want that arrow to move in to massively reduce overshoot of planetary boundaries while meeting people's needs. Where their views come apart, particularly, I would believe, is in the policies that would get us there in the mindset that would enable us to come up with those policies, but also particularly on what we think is going to be the future of GDP and of growth in relation to that transformation. And this is where the debate gets incredibly interesting. But I think it's really valuable to notice where there is a common point, because that is what enables us to listen and appreciate contrasting points of view. I'm not going to dive into that debate right now, but we can bring it up in the questions if we want. What I want to do is ask, what kind of mindset would give us the chance of reorienting our economies? That's what motivated me as an economic student at university 30 years ago. I was really frustrated by the mindset I was taught 
I'm even more frustrated that it is still the predominant mindset taught in universities around the world. And that's why I wrote Donut Economics. Having drawn the donut diagram and seeing the traction it has, I wanted to lay down a marker for the mindset that I believe will give us even half a chance of moving towards it. Inspired by Buckminster Fuller, right? Let's just not continue to fight the existing reality. I did not want to fight this constructs and assumptions of mainstream economics, but rather build a new model, propose an alternative. And so it comes with this playful name, Donut Economics. It comes with regenerative and distributive design, changing the language and changing the frame so we're not always fighting against the old, but reframing it. And that's one way you can open up a new conversation with people who might otherwise have been stuck in their positions. And so Donut Economics is not just the donut. It's the first, right? The donut is the first of seven ways to think, change the goal from endless growth to the donut. But I just want to point out that we can't load everything onto the donut. It's accompanied by a much bigger vision of the economy embedded in society, embedded in the living world, a much richer portrait of humanity, not rational economic man, but social adaptable humans. We need to nurture the best of human nature, recognize that we need to understand systems thinking and to see our economy and of course the living world as a complex adaptive system. We cannot control it, we can steward it. And therefore we need to pursue different dynamics, not growth, but distributive design and regenerative design. And for me, these are the overarching dynamics we are trying to bring about and that therefore questions the outdated addiction to endless growth, but forces us to ask how are our economies currently structurally dependent upon endless growth and how can we therefore take that structural dependence out of them to give them a chance to evolve and to pursue actually what we are in search of, a thriving future that is regenerative and distributive by design. So these are the ideas I put out in the book in 2017 and it blew me away that People just quickly got in touch and said, we want to do this. We want to do this in our company, in our city government, in our community. I want to do this in my own life. And that's what motivated me to co-found Donut Economics Action Lab. And I want to share with you some of the uh, work that's been going on there. So I'm going to dive into the world of place-based transformation. Mayors and councillors started saying, can we can we live in the donut here? What would it mean to aim to live in the donut here in our city, in our town, in our district? And so that's one of the frameworks that we've developed. So what would it mean for our city to live in the donut? Let me introduce you to the frame of the four lens portrait, which I know has been used in the Greater Geneva area and in your own university, which I'm delighted to explore today. So when we are approached on this question, what would it mean for a city or town to live in the donut? Well, let's unroll the donut. Let's make some space between that social foundation and the ecological ceiling. And inside there is a very little question that of course is actually a really big question. How can our city or town become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Yes, that is a complex question. It's holding a lot. And the reason it's complex is because we, we want to divide this into four lenses and recognize that there's both the social on the bottom half and the ecological on the top half, but there's also the local aspiration for what it will be like in this place and the global responsibility. We are connected to the whole world in the room that you're in, just as in the room that I am And Think of all the clothing you're wearing, the food you've eaten, the electronics we're using to communicate, the construction materials, the seats, the carpets. It's not all been made in Switzerland as everything around me was not made in the UK. We have imported these. So we have to look at our material and energy connection to the whole world and also to people worldwide who made the clothes we wear, packed the food we eat, assembled our phones and computers. How do we live well here while respecting their ability to live well too? So we've got the social and ecological, the local and the global, four lenses. Let me just introduce you to each one of these lenses and I invite you to think it through for your own locality. So how can everyone in our city thrive? What would it mean where you are for everybody to have good food, decent housing, transport, healthcare, education? What are the standards of your place 
that we say this is the bare minimum to which every person here has a claim? And how can we find those who are, are falling below it? What would it mean to put in place policies that ensure they are brought above that social foundation? This is, of course, where most places focus most of the time about their own population. They have a huge responsibility to do so, but our responsibility goes beyond this alone. So how can our city be as generous as the wildland next door? If you were to, to go out into the wildland around Lausanne, where is nature? Where's a place you could go where nature is really in her closest to her wild natural health? And right there, you could measure nature's generosity because everywhere on earth, nature has figured out how to sequester carbon, how to store groundwater after a storm, how to house biodiversity, how to cool the air from the top of the trees to the floor of the forest. And all of these generosities of nature can be like an ecological performance standard for our own towns. What if we aimed to make our own cities as absorbent of stormwater as nature is, rather than have flooded streets, to cool the air in the city, rather than have an urban heat island effect on a hot day, to house biodiversity, rather than to have a desert with no animals or pollinators alive, to store carbon in the buildings, rather than to release it when we construct. So these are the local ecological aspirations of place. They come from the work of the biomimicry thinker, Janine Benyus. These are the local aspirations, right? Thriving people in a thriving place. And I'm sure Switzerland, as well as Norway and Denmark and Sweden, scores really highly in everybody's minds of these are great places to live. You have a good lifestyle and you have great nature around you. But this is, of course, only half of the picture of every place because we have to ask how is living well here made possible thanks to the materials and the work of people worldwide? So how do we make sure we live within planetary boundaries? This is the story of the red ecological overshoot of our national donuts. How do we come back within the energy and material requirements that means that this place respects planetary boundaries? What would that share be? How could we create a far more circular economy so that resources are used again and again? A far more energy efficient economy so we switch from fossil fuels to renewable energies but reduce our demand overall too? How do we change the way we live in order to make that possible? And still thinking of our connection to the whole world, the impacts we have on people worldwide, people working in global supply chains, producing the clothing, the food, the electronics on which we depend. Are they paid a decent wage? What is the relation of this place to refugees or to immigrants who are arriving? What is the policy of welcome, the culture of welcome? And what is our obligation towards those who are impacted by the fierce effects of climate change today that we know that our lifestyles have contributed towards making that happen? So this is the global social lens, which is probably the one that places spend least time thinking about. There's certainly the least data available for this one. Those are the four lenses of the portrait of a place. And they have been used in towns and cities and states and districts around the world, over 70 places and now engaging with this. And one of the questions that was sent to me in advance was, why is it happening more locally and not nationally? And I think this is a really great question. I can't give you a, a confirmed definitive answer, but let's ask ourselves, is it just, it's by coincidence that the city of Amsterdam, it was the right people in the right place at the right moment, in the height of the COVID crisis, Amsterdam created a city portrait, but then they launched it in the height of COVID. Part of their circularity strategy, commitment, a really driven vice mayor of the city. Is this coincidence that and then this city inspired other cities through peer-to-peer -peer inspiration? Copenhagen, Brussels, Barcelona. We watched the ripple effects, ping, 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 ping. And now it's going from Europe more globally. Is that coincidence or is that the only way it was possible to happen? Or could it have happened or could it happen at the national level? And I just want to contrast this. I think the national level is much harder. And one reason, if we think about nations as a collective, I mean, no political leader wants to lose their place in this G20 family photo. 
But if any one nation said it was going to move away from growth towards well-being, as a tiny handful of nations have said, well, if they're in this photo, they're very likely to get kicked out because growth underpins military, industrial, geopolitical power. So this is, to me, one of the major ways in which our economies are currently locked into growth dependency structurally. And this is one, I don't think the answer to this is kind of come from within economics. I think it's an international governance relation question of how do we break out of this? I see on the wall at the G20, it says people, planet, prosperity. It would have been a little bit more honest if they've added power because that is what it, that that is what they're ultimately holding there. How do we reorient power towards a far more thriving future? This is a big, profound question that I certainly do not have an answer towards. So let me show you some examples of some places at the city, at the sub-national level, towns, districts, states that have been putting this concept into practice. What happens when the recipe actually gets baked? Where do we have motion and uh, momentum and engagement? And, and where are some of the challenges? I'm going to start just with one of the recent examples, the city of Glasgow in Scotland have created a portrait, a vision of what they want to be as a thriving city. So this is a place using the concept of the donut to engage citizens, to re-envision the future, to come up with a fresh and very globally grounded vision of their future. You can see that they've got the, the social and the ecological, the local and the global, starting on that journey. And we will watch them and accompany them over the coming years. Does this enable them to have not just a different conversation, but to change the policies that get put into practice in the city of Glasgow? And how does that affect them in the context of Scotland, in the context of the UK, where not every place is doing this and the national government, the politicians certainly aren't calling for this. How do you start to make change happen in a locality surrounded by an alternative worldview? This is part of the struggle of transition. Cornwall is a few years ahead. The county of Cornwall in the south of, of, of the UK have turned the donut into a decision-making wheel. And every time they have an infrastructural project, they will test it through the lenses of the donut. So you can see it there, the, the Saints Trail, which was a bike trail going through the county. How does this impact on our ability to live in the donut? How can we redraw, redesign it to improve those outcomes? And they've also created a plan towards 2050 so using the donut for long-term vision, showing here in almost like traffic light colors where things are getting better, getting worse or stayed the same. And I don't even need to explain that because we can all read those traffic light colors. Imagine how much richer this picture is than Cornwall reporting that their GDP has grown by 1.3% over the last year. So what, what does that tell us about thriving people in a thriving place? This is a much richer visual dashboard of full of information that matters. In Ipoh in Malaysia, the city there have set the ambition, they want to be the first city in Asia aiming to live in the donut. So this is taking it far from its current European starting point. And at Donut Economics Action Lab, we work particularly hard to connect with pioneers further away, particularly in the global south, to see, is this useful in your context? How do we need to adapt these concepts to your concept to make it work? What does it mean in a country that is still pursuing growth? How can Malaysia and cities within it move towards thriving, even as they still aim to meet many of people's basic needs? Barcelona, coming back to Europe, this image you can see, many many trees in the city it used to be a bustling crossroads full of cars they took the cars out they brought community in they filled it with trees so it's ecological and social at the same time you can see they've unrolled the donut and gathered the data on all of those dimensions and they're using it as a concept for thinking about creating a sustainability culture in the city how do you change people's mindsets towards choosing and understanding why it's important to live sustainably like this. I think Barcelona is one of the cities that's really pioneering on many fronts in terms of living well within limits. And we're delighted that they've chosen to use the donut as part of that visualization, the metrics and telling the story to their citizenry. Moving to Bhutan, the government of Bhutan uh, came across the donut and said, 
of all the concepts coming out of Western economic thought, this really resonates closely with our concept of gross national happiness. So we want to use the two together, gross national happiness in the donut, as they said, towards reimagining the future of the capital city, Timpu. So the donut and gross national happiness have been used together in the planning for the future of the capital city. As you can see, these beautiful cartoons imagining life in Timpu in 2047, thriving people in an ecologically thriving place. Again, that plan for the city has been made. Now, how will it be implemented? What regenerative and distributive design is possible? What will it mean for the market, for the state, for ownership of resources? Deep, deep economic questions underpinning such a vision. Let me give you this last example from a city very close to where I am, Birmingham in the UK. One neighbourhood that's been long underserved has an amazing organisation in it called Civic Square. And they are using the donut at the smallest known scale, which is at the neighbourhood scale. They've done a, a donut, as you can see, just for the small, small district of Ladywood in Birmingham. And they're using it as a concept for retrofitting one street. Can we do a street level retrofit, which is going to have to be repeated again and again and again across the country? But you, what you can see here is the community engagement, the playfulness, and they've invited everybody to the economic conversation, which I find incredibly compelling. We are all uh, voices in this e local economic conversation. So if you're interested in some of the examples I've shared, my colleague Leonora Kucheva, who is our city's lead, wrote them up in this report. She found there were nine different ways that places are getting started. And that's important for us. We are not telling anywhere this is how to do it. That would be very top down and weird because it's the people of the place who know the context, the locality, what's possible here, the openings. So we are listening and learning back. How are you getting started? How are you introducing the donut? Where is it flowing? Where is it getting stuck? What do we need to change in not just this recipe, but the cooking instructions to make it flow? What we have learned is the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration is massive. So when one place does something new, like a university, Others will say, oh, have you seen what they've done over there? We thought that was impossible. They've gone and done it. And that opens up a whole level of permission and inspiration in people who've been waiting to, for a signal to act. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the world of universities. Finally, let me finish by saying we collaborated with uh, an organization called Home.Earth from Denmark on thinking about sectoral applications of the donut. So not just a place based, but what if we want to do it in the construction sector, the built environment. And they've, together with a large team of us, created the Manual of Donut for Urban Development. It's a very ambitious standard, which is what we made, what made us keep working with them. They did not try to water it down to make it sort of feasible for today's business world. They ratcheted up their standards of what it would mean to construct or retrofit to be aligned with the vision of the donut, it's a high standard, but they are starting to use it in practice. And they are, I know they're changing the conversation in the world of construction and architecture. So let me finish there. Many of the tools that I've shared are from our platform, uh, donateconomics.org. As an organization, we have the privilege of being fully funded by foundations so that we can put everything we do in the commons. We believe that ideas like these need to be in the commons. That is the way they will be able to spread and scale as fast as possible. We collaborate with researchers, with organizations, with civic leaders who pick them up and say, this makes sense to us here. It is a tool useful to us for the transformation that we want to undertake. And so we collaborate and we learn together so that this can inspire many, many others who will follow. So this is a perfect moment for me to hand over to one of the pioneers of the Lausanne Donut, of Uni, sorry, of the Uni, University of Lausanne Donut, of Camille Gilots, who will present to you, I think, what you've done with it locally. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation we're going to have. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you for your insights and good afternoon to everyone. Well, first of all, I would like to address a huge thank you to Kate Reworth. 
It's a great honor to welcome you today at the University of Lausanne and to have a chance to present you what is happening here. Thank you also to Jacques Dubochet, who had the wonderful idea to invite you as a speaker in his conferences cycle. Well, as a member of the Competence Center in Sustainability of UNIL, I will take a few minutes to present the UNIL's donut, the fairy baked for the University of Lausanne, um, a donut which has been achieved one year ago, but which is only the first step of a broader process happening in UNIL. So let's begin by some background information. Why a donut for UNIL? In late 2021, at the Competency Center in Sustainability, we were finishing our study to apply the donut model to the area of the Greater Geneva. And on the same time, UNIL's rectorate was writing its roadmap for the years 2021-2026. In this roadmap, the UNIL's rectorate wrote that one of its objectives was to reduce the impacts of UNIL within ecological limits of our ecosystem while fulfilling its social mission. Well, respecting the ecological limits of Earth is not trivial. That's an ambitious challenge in line with scientific recommendations. To meet this objective 4.3, the first step was to carry out the diagnosis of the impacts of UNIL to know, to, to quantify the extent of the global changes required. To do so, we choose the donut, the donut model, and we started to downscale it to UNIL with my colleague Cecilia Matashi, who is there somewhere, and, and help from other colleagues. We adapted the downscaling methodology used for cities to a university scale. And uh, one year ago, in the beginning of 2023, the first draft of Union's Donut was ready. Let's dive a bit deeper in this tool. The first question was, when we are looking for, when we are looking, talking about impacts of Union, what are we talking about? In 2022, we decided that the UNIL's donut will give a picture of the operational impacts of UNIL. It means that UNIL's donut includes the energy we consume, the food we eat at UNIL, but also the way how we move to and travel from UNIL and the goods we are consuming every day for teaching, searching, or studying at UNIL. In this way, UNIL's donut counts the upstream impacts of UNIL's operation, of UNIL's activities, but it's also have a look on the well-being and the health of people, of humans and non-human beings on the university campus. But the UNIL's data does not include the downstream ecological and social impacts of what we learn and what we find thanks to our researchers at UNIL. To make it short, UNIL's donuts is about the impacts of UNIL activities and not about the content of UNIL activities. To build UNIL's donuts, we used the four lenses tool just presented by Kate before. The ecological sailing of UNIL's donut contains eight components, four planetary boundaries and four components of our ecosystem here in Lausanne. And the social foundation of Yunus Danon contains six components, five parameters of the social quality in the community of students and employees of UNIL, and one parameter that reports the impacts on the social foundation of people abroad working in UNIL's supply chains. If we enroll this four lenses tool, here is the donut framework adapted for UNIL. On the bottom half, we find the global indicators, and on the upper part, the local ind indicators. Having this framework was the first step, but then we had to quantify the state of each of these indicators. So let's see how quickly, beginning from the global lenses. UNIL's global impacts have been quantified by a huge material flow analysis, MFA, led by Cecilia, 
and inspired by a study published in 2022 in which the authors quantified the carbon and biodiversity footprints of Oxford University. Based on Oxford's methodology and with the help of UNIL's technical services, we counted the flow of people, energy and goods related to UNIL's activities. By crossing this data with a life cycle inventory database, we have been able, with some uncertainties for sure, to quantify the impacts of UNIL on four planetary boundaries. To draw the donuts, UNIL's impacts for the year 2019 are compared with the global planetary boundary allocated to UNIL for the year 2050. And then, to quantify the global social impacts of UNIL's consumption, we also crossed the consumption data with a social database in order to estimate the more than savory footprint of our university. Let's see the results. We can see that three of the four planetary boundaries explored are exceeded by UNIL's activities, up to a factor of 30 for the biodiversity footprint. And despite our hopes for addressing the global social lens of a donut, we observe that the databases on social impacts in global supply chains are not yet ready for calculating the more than savory footprint of our university. Now let's have a look on the upper part of a donut. To address the local ecological lens of Unil's donut, we worked with some experts of the local ecosystem to select the components, indicators, and targets for 2050. Three dimensions are inspired by the ecological infrastructure framework. To, the, to it, we add the air quality and the water footprint at local scale to build our local ecosystem, our local ecological sailing. And here are the results. As you can see, the local ecosystem around Lausanne also suffers some problems. Air quality, especially, and for example, exceeds by far the thresholds proposed by the World Health Organization for ensuring human health regarding air pollution. Finally, to address the social local lens, we created a working group to rethink the social foundation of Kate Donut for a teaching and searching institution such as UNIL. The group, led by Samuel Dupoirier, worked on the social dimensions and indicators of a donut. The group decided to build on UNIL's social foundation, they decided to build on the social quality theory to contain, that contains four dimensions, social cohesion, inclusion, empowerment, and socioeconomic security of UNIL's community. And the group decided also to add the parameter of physical and mental health to the social foundation of UNIL's donuts. So, the local social lens of Unilus Donut contains five parameters, but the data about these parameters were incomplete at UNIL, and the group voted by majority for creating consolidated data in the future instead of filling the donut with unsatisfying data. So the social foundation of Unilus Donut is, for now, completely grayed. But here appears, finally, the donut downscaled for the University of Lausanne. Since all these calculations have been done so one year ago, the donut is becoming a precious tool to guide and trigger action here. Let's see how. If we go back to the orig original target of Unius Rectorate, and based on this simple donut drawing, what does it mean to reduce the impacts of UNIL within ecological limits of our ecosystem while fulfilling its social mission. It means, for example, that UNIL has had to decrease its greenhouse gas emission by 60% by 2035. The global footprint 
carbon footprint of your needle has to follow this diving curve, but that's also the case for other ecological impacts, such as the biodiversity footprint, for example. And these dec decreases have to occur without harming the satisfaction of the fundamental needs of UNIL's community. To start action, we have to better know the issue. So here is the carbon footprint of each UNIL's activity. We can see that flights, laboratory equipment, and heating energy for buildings were the three main sources of greenhouse gas emission of UNIL in 2019. But the Donald is a multiple indicators tool and helps to identify our challenges. So by having a look on the biodiversity footprint of UNIL, for example, we can see that IT equipment and meat consumption also come out. Knowing that and many of the results, the question is where to begin? From which door do we enter the donut at UNIL? And how can we guide the whole academic community towards the just and safe space of the donut? So many questions that is addressing on these days the rectorate of UNIL to transform UNIL's donut into a compass for guiding concrete action. To hear about the process, please welcome Benoit Franc, our vice rector in charge of ecological transition at UNIL. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Camille. Uh, it's a great honor for, for me uh, that I address uh, you today in the presence of the author of the tool that now guides our daily actions in steering the ecological transition strategy in our institution. Thank you, Kate, for your outstanding and enlightening uh, contribution. And thank you, Jacques, to uh, invite uh, today uh, us. Thanks to Camille's insight, you have now um, you now have uh, an, an, an understanding of how UNIL extends beyond uh, planetary boundaries. Now, I will briefly explain why donut, the, the donut is truly a crucial navigation tool to guide our uh, ecological strategy. Uh, as Camille uh, mentioned earlier, the Rectorate uh, works with a strategic plan draft up and taking office for a five-year per period. In early 2022, um, we published our plan titled Preparing Tomorrow, uh, in which we outlined objective 4.3, as you already seen. Under these objectives, two simple measures were defined. First, setting quantified goals and establishing a roadmap, and two, measuring progress and disseminating results. You understand that we defined our quantified goal by establish, uh, establishing the unit donut, and currently we are collectively developing uh, the roadmap. We already have the, the tool needed to measure uh, our progress, by updating our donut, we'll see how. And now we uh, are working on the disseminating of the first results. Sustainability has been con a concern for UNIL for more than a decade. I've been uh, involved in this effort for around 12 years now, during which we have accomplished a lot. So what changes uh, with the current approach? Well, it's precisely the donut. Until no, now, um, all our policies were focused on what seemed achievable. 
all good intentions were mobilized to impro improve uh, our uh, balance sheet and reduce our environmental impacts, yielding encouraging uh, results. However, two questions have occupied me and my colleagues for years. First, by relying on sectoral assessments, such as carbon footprints, are we truly addressing the complexity of environmental and social issues? And second question, are we up to the challenge? And as you understand, the answer to, the, to, to these two questions is unfortunately no. We needed a tool that is both easy to understand and ca capable to, to of addressing the complexity of the issues. And today I can say to my colleagues, we are not on the right trajectory, but it's easy to correct. I'm kidding. We just need to empty the red boxes that exceed the green circle. With the donut, we have a tool that articulates social and environmental issues facilitating the necessary trade-offs. We now have both the starting point and the goal to achieve by 2050. It's very powerful to show the gap between where we are and where we should be. Then to truly change UNIL's trajectory, directorate alone is not enough. It must mobilize the entire community. That's why we set up a participatory democracy process, the transition assembly, which reported uh, back to us this autumn. Based on the, on the diagnosis provided by UNIL Donut, established by Camille and Cecilia, the transition assembly uh, was set up to propose, uh, to, to, to propose solutions to achieve the green circle. Made up, by, uh, of, uh, made up of 60, 60 members drowned at random from the university com community, it worked uh, throughout the academic year 22-23. And the assembly produced a report containing 28 objectives and, and 146 measures. By the way, uh, the man, uh, documentary movies was made uh, to document this process and you can find it on uh, YouTube. Our, our institution uh, was founded almost 500 years ago. As a rectorate, we have the responsibility to adapt its trajectory so that it continues to shine as much as possible over the next, next half millennium? How can we remain a research and teaching institution that strive for collective ex uh, excellence and at the same time enter the donut green circle? With the assembly's report and the compass provided by uh, the UNIL donut, we have the element needed to initiate the shift. In consultation with the various components of UNIL, we are currently drafting our roadmap for the coming years, which, will, we, we, which we will present normally at the end of May. It, inclu it includes around 10 commitments together with uh, concrete actions, such as reinventing a scientific practice that no longer relies on air travel, or increasing the lifespan of our scientific equipment, among others. 
The good news so far is that nobody is questioning the diagnosis and the limits that need to be set. Our university seems to be equipped uh, to conduct concrete experiments on itself and report on them. We may make mistakes, learned, learn to, uh, from them and try again. Based on evolving science, we will make decision to steer our strategy, our trajectory in the direction of the donuts. So we now have to translate the donut into a long-term monitoring tool to assess our pro progress. How can we continue to carry out socially re relevant research within the limits of the biosphere? How can we ensure that our teaching and training mission uh, while taking these issues fully into account. We are working on the assumption that we can continue to be a recognized uh, institution of research and higher education while joining uh, the safe and just space of the green circle. We are aware uh, of the limitation of this approach and we are going to talk about it document it and suggest improvement. It is as if we were a university. So could you imagine that a little pastry could be such a powerful navigation tool? It's really inc incredible and I will really thank the pastry chef, uh, Kate. So thank you once again for your inspi inspiration and I give the floor to uh, Gia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay, Camille and Benoit for this very insightful presentation. I will now invite our panelists, Camille and Julia, to join me on stage. But before diving into the discussion, I would like to give the opportunity to Kate to react to what you've heard. The University of Lausanne is the first academic institution worldwide using the donut for its ecological and social transformation strategy. How do you feel about it? Uh, it's fantastic. It's, I'm, I'm feeling incredibly energized and wanting to make sure that this story and, and what Camille and Benoit just shared is shared really widely because I have absolutely no doubt this pioneering work that you're doing is going to inspire other universities. It's going to give them the beginnings of a methodology. You've said yourselves, there's still so much to do. We are all on a path together to create these 21st century metrics. They don't exist yet. So every pioneering initiative like this one takes us all one step closer towards them. I really appreciate what Benoit just said about, well, we used to just say, what can we do? And now we ask, what must we do? And if the donut has made that transformation, that's massive. And then the use and the engagement of a transition assembly, I think is beautiful because for a new economic thinking must be accompanied by new democratic organizing and engagement. And it's such a powerful way of bringing people into this conversation and taking the decisions we must make. So I massively applaud what you've done here and I can't wait to watch where will be the next place to, to follow your lead. Oh, thank you very much, Kate, for this reaction. Um, now I would like to open the discussion on the opportunities and challenges for the donut as a tool to activate changes. Julia, thanks a lot for being with us today and leading, leading this panel session. You're also an expert of the application of this model since you're the co-author of a research, A Good Life for All Within Planetary Boundaries, which quantified the donut for most country in the world. Do you think the donut can foster local action at the political or civil society level? Thanks, Gia, and uh, thanks, to, thanks to everybody. Um, I think that the, one of the things that the donut does, and I think that Kate explains this also very well in the book, 
uh, which I really recommend. Don't just look at the picture, go and look at the book. And we actually use it in teaching at UNIL. Maybe we'll talk about that as well. Um, is that we have to have new ways of seeing our current situation in order to face our problems. And one of the things that the donut allows people to do is it allows them to sort of redefine their job description. Because the, the problem is that we have jobs and institutions and roles that correspond to imperfect solutions to problems that are about 200 years old usually. And uh, so we really need to be able to, to think beyond what those roles are and the current way of doing things since that's driving us towards various kinds of disaster. And I, I, think that, I think that the donut allows people to do that. It allows them to see the bigger picture and how they might want to fit into it. And that basically is one of the really, really big things we need to unlock, is to give people the freedom to redefine their jobs. Um, and maybe we can talk about that as well. In, in Switzerland, people tend to take that uh, a bit too seriously. You give them a job to do, and they do that job. And, and sometimes they, they shouldn't. Um, so maybe we can, uh, maybe we can uh, move to the, to the panel discussion. And um, I think we're just going to talk, start talking, uh, the, the three of us, with Gemi and with Kate, and then it will be opened up to the, to the public. And um, I was very struck by Jacques' um, recipe joke and all the food jokes throughout, the food references throughout the, the, the various talks. And uh, one thing is that different areas have different cultures of cuisine. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm wondering, when Kate, when you showed that map, I was also almost seeing it as a menu, you know, like how the, how the, how the donut is baked in different places. So does, does the donut, in your experience, match different cultures? And in which way are different uh, ways of doing things um, in terms of the political economy or in terms of cu customs? Uh, how, do, how do those things change the way the donut is taken forward? Great question. Well, I'll first of all say um, that most cultures in the world have a donut circular shaped food. Who knew? Uh, so whether it's Simit economics in Turkey or Vadu in India or um, it just has so many, many, many names. And actually, we love celebrating and, and always say to people, bring your own local cultural food. Doesn't have to be a donut. Goodness, bring the concept. And, and that's, of course, a metaphor for bring your own reality, bring what resonates where you are. So the framework is adapted in every place. What is the social foundation where you are? What makes ecological sense where you are? We have been very... Um, clear from the beginning that it was important that the overarching framework that I showed, those four lenses, is changed in every locality. So you can't compare the donut of Barcelona directly to the donut of Brussels, directly to the donut of Copenhagen. They've been created differently. And I think one of the reasons for that is, as Camille explained in her presentation, some of the metrics don't exist yet. We're only just deciding between us what should be the parameters that we measure by. So let's have many experiments that we'll all learn from each other. But also people have introduced it into localities differently depending on the political circumstance of place. And I have to say, Julia, now that you're on stage, I'm really delighted that, and not at all surprised that this event is happening in Lausanne and you are there. I just want to say to everybody, Julia has been such a pioneer of this work internationally on her work on living well within limits, but also bringing the donut into teaching, holding it to a really high academic stand, but always with a clear purpose and a socio-political ecological conscience. I think you are exemplary in this work and it makes absolute sense to me that you are here holding this conversation now, you, you know, so key in downscaling the donuts in the first iteration. So thank you for all the work you've done and, and, and the way you continue to pioneer bringing this work forward. Thanks, Kate. But I, I do have to say that I, I was not responsible for any of this. None, <laughs> none of what was shown today was my work whatsoever. I, um, I, the, the, the team here is extraordinary. And the, 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 there's a lot of leadership in this room, actually, that uh, you unfortunately can't see. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing Nelly, I'm seeing Frédéric, and the, the, the whole team of this, uh, uh, this organization has really done this. And obviously, Kemi take, taking uh, a, a very leading role. So uh, Kemi, I had a question for you. Um, what was it like, because we, we, we heard from, from Kate about the national cultural differences or the city cultural differences of the donut. 
Um, I think in Greater Geneva, you had a lot of diversity in a small area. Um, do you want to say a few words about that? Because you were involved in the, in the Greater Geneva Donut as well. Yeah, um, we, already, we also done scale the donut for the Greater Geneva before UNIL. Well, we, it was not really a participative process, so we were not really facing the diversity of people, unfortunately. So we did not really have the chance to address it. It was like more um, an academic work. Uh, so we, um, we based the social foundation on the human needs theory, and it was pretty, pretty academic. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, but th then you also had the question of getting it accepted, of, tra yeah. of communicating it. Yeah, well, um, the donut, well, we organized um, two or three workshops with some, some technicians from cities of the Greater Geneva to select the dimensions of the donut of the Greater Geneva and to work on indicators and targets. Um, it was, it was um, interesting to see how much the um, donut is a pedagogic tool to make people understanding the objective and the, the issue, the, the main issue. And that's always interesting to see that the donut provokes a better acceptation of the worrying environmental statements because it also includes the social foundation. So the compass seems complete, except for people who are used to know the sustainable development framework with these three cycles. There is environment, uh, environment, social, and economy. And some people said, where is economy? So maybe, Kate, where is economy in the donut? <laughs> Great question. So economy isn't in the donut because economy itself is a construct that is in service to life. So the economy is not the goal in itself. The goal is to enable everyone in the world to thrive within the means of the living planet. And going back to the presentation I made earlier, the donut is the first way to think. It's the goal. Then we ask what kind of economic thinking and policies would be in service of that. So I think alongside the donut, we could have measures, new metrics. Is our economy becoming more distributive by design? How should we measure that? Is our economy becoming far more regenerative by design? And how do we ensure that finance and ownership of institutions is in service to that? So it's a deep, deep, deep redesign of economics. I, it was very important to me not just to put mainstream economic thinking alongside it, because then we get back into the old three circles of sustainability, which is it's actually mostly focused on economics and we have a nice little bit of social and environmental. I wanted to flip that and put them first and build a, a vision around that and then ask what kind of economic system and policies is in service to achieving that. Because I think there are profound problems with the construction of our economic tools and systems today that draw us away from it. And this take, I mean, that takes us back to the question about how we are structurally dependent upon endless growth at the moment in the way we fund our pensions, in the way we legally incentivize companies, in the power of shareholders, the power of the financial system, this needs redesign. And we, I think one way to do that is to center clarity around our core values and then ask how those systems, as Julia said, they've been designed 100, 200 years ago. How do we redesign them to be in service? So not just redefining our, our job description, great point, redesigning the very institutions of which we're a part. Well, that's, uh, that's, that, that brings me very nicely to my next question, uh, or one of the next points I wanted to talk about with you, which is the university as an institution and maybe how we need to redesign that. And I, I, I do want to say, I do want to credit this university for doing, uh, having a very open-minded approach to this and thinking, you know, you know, this is a lot about the strategy of the university, the role of the university in public, the role of the university in engagement. Um, when uh, um, university professors who shall remain nameless started getting arrested in certain numbers. Um, and uh, so, so, but the, the question is, how do, how do things change in that, in that dimension as well? And one of the things I, 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 I really want also the, this audience to recognize is that you are working at a university here at Oxford, but you not, have not necessarily benefited, let's say, from the full strength of academic recognition 
um, in terms of what, what you've done, and you've also had to take what you're doing and create a new institution to do it, which is the Donut Economics Action Lab. And so this question of navigating what exists and trying to shake it up a little bit and having colleagues being somewhat resistant sometimes, and then doing the tremendous work you're doing, how does that all work together? Oh, okay. Um, just quickly on my relation. In, I, I live in the city of Oxford. I moved here 20 years ago to work for Oxfam. Yeah. That's why I'm in Oxford. And actually it was the Diana Liverman of uh, who worked at the Environmental Change Institute. It was so it's from the School of Geography that this work was first recognized. And she asked me to come and teach in the geography school. So I'm based in, in Oxford University in the Environmental Change Institute. I have no contact with the economics department. Uh, and I think that tells us a lot. And it's very it it's, happens a lot around the world that people who are doing new economic thinking very often are not positioned in an economics department. And it tells us something about silos. It tells us something about um, structures of inertia. I, I have a very strong dynamic principle, which is to go where the energy is. We follow whoever wants to pioneer the donut. I work where it's invited. I don't want to spend my time knocking on shut doors. And so within Oxford University, um, I'm in the Environmental Change Institute. In fact, this time last year, I held a guerrilla course in donut economics for any student who'd come to the city for Oxford University or Oxford Brookes University. If they'd come to the city to study economics of any kind, they were welcome to an eight week course in donut economics. It was a chance for me to experiment offline the room the, the number of students wanting to enroll went up and up and up and up we ended up in the business school in the biggest lecture theater that the university had and i think that sent a strong signal that students coming to the university want something different than what's being offered in the curriculum and this isn't true only of oxford this is true of so many universities offering economics but let me come to the design of our institutions there is another framework that we use in Donut Economics Action Lab for this, because when the city of Amsterdam, the first pioneer as a city, said, we want to do the donut, we've done our city portrait, they quickly came back and said, whoa, we need to transform our own organization if we're going to have a chance of doing that. Can you help us think about the design of our organization? So we have this design framework, which comes from a, a, an economic thinker, Marjorie Kelly in the U.S., so let me just invite you to think of UNIL through this lens and any institution of which we are a part that needs to transform. These five design traits deeply shape what we can and can't do and what, what is possible for our institutions. What is the purpose of this institution? Why does it exist? What is it in service of that clarity of our purpose and mission? What are the networks of relationship with the staff, with the students, with the supply chains, with the employees, with the community around the university? And again, I think the transition assembly is a beautiful example of drawing on those networks of relationship to help make new decisions. How is the university governed? Who is in the room and whose interests are in the room when decisions are made? Do future generations have a voice? Does nature have a voice in the decision? Do the students have a voice? Going deeper, how is it owned? How is the university owned? Who owns the land and the buildings of the university? Because how it's owned is going to deeply also shape how it's financed, where the financing for the university's activities come from and what that finance is therefore expecting and extracting or reinvesting. So we use this framework for talking with any company, any university, any institution to think about the deep design of our own organisations. And of course, these, these five design traits are always present. They're in present in every conversation we have, but they're often off the table, out of sight, not explicitly talked about. And, and we should put them visible in sight and ask ourselves, what can we let go of and leave behind? What is it time to just stop doing? And what can we amplify and start and spread as an experiment, as a new practice, rewriting not just our job description, but our institutional design? I really believe that these deep design traits will have to transform if we are to transform the actual dynamics of our practice. Kate, thank you so much for these insights. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you presented the seven principles of your donut economics, and especially these principles, are, are, are they 
valid for an institution uh, like a like UNIL or for a city? What, what, how can we use these principles, not for a company or for um, the macroeconomic model, but for a university or a city? I do think these, the principles, that, I, that if it's the seven ways to think like a 21st century economist that I shared, I mean, I framed them as an economist because I came from an economics education myself, but they are principles that I think guide us well, uh, recognize the richness of human nature. How do we incentivize each other? How do we collaborate and cooperate rather than compete? Last century's economics taught us to compete. It won't take us far. How do we recognize the systems of which we're a part and therefore find leverage points for intervening? How do we strengthen reinforcing feedback to make change happen? So the more that we're systems thinkers within our own institutions, we can make smart interventions. How can we make sure our university is distributive of value and opportunity? Amongst whom? What values and opportunities do we want to distribute? How do we want to make sure that they don't get concentrated in the hands of a few. How can the university be regenerative by design? Create a circular economy definitely applies. And how can the university think about growth? Every organization wants to grow. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life, but we grow until we're grown up. So what is the university seeking to grow? And at what point is it grown up? And how do we move away from just growth for growth's sake are we financially pressured to do that? Or what's driving that? How do we know when we are mature? And how do we enable ourselves to thrive? So I think these seven principles resonate. Of course, let me say that for me, they're just the first seven. There were seven that were obvious to me. I think there's going to be eight, nine, 10, 11. Let's keep adding to them. So Donut Economics was offered as a, a starting point, not a finishing point for 21st century economics. And in my mind, the very best way to find out what really makes sense is to practice it. That's why we set up Donut Economics Action Lab to work with people like yourselves who are saying, right, take the ideas off the page into practice. Let's actually do this. Let's run into the challenges of reality. What are we learning? And we are now learning back from you. What can we learn back from you that we can then share with other places that want to follow your lead? Well, Thanks a lot to the three of you for this fascinating discussion. I'm sure there is still a lot to be said, but I would like now to open the discussion to the audience. Uh, I will take the question in the room, but first, today's event is apparently generating a lot of reaction online. So, Johan, could you start by sharing with us what are the main questions we received? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, with pleasure. Um, so, indeed, there's a lot of questions, so I've tried to bun uh, uh, bundle them together. and. I will ask um, three themes with a few sub-questions in them. Um, you take them however you can and how they come. Um, so I will let you see how you want to answer. The first one, there's been a few questions about the theory basics, actually. So um, is it possible for you to walk us through a little bit the theoretical foundations of the donut economics model? Um, basically, what is there beyond uh, carbon footprints in terms of the ecological limits, um, in terms of the social uh, part? How do you define the basic needs? How do they rela relate to the planetary, planetary boundaries? Um, who decides? Who participates? How to deal with opposite interests? Again, lots of questions. You will see what you want to, to, to take from that. Um, a second theme uh, is on strategy, um, is how can we demonstrate that operating within limits is not a constraint, but an opportunity, which I think um, opens to quite some interesting uh, thoughts. Um, and then finally, about action. Um, a lot of questions about how to apply it uh, in a private company for business. So maybe can you um, touch on how to, uh, how to use the donut uh, economics theory um, within a business for a sustainability strategy? And maybe, Camille, you can uh, say a few words about how it relates to using it for an institution and how it was done uh, here. Thank you. Do you want Who me wants to, to start? <laughs> You want me to start? Okay, so I'm not going to, I don't want to go too much into the, the details of the donut framework, but just if I bring it back up again here, <laughs> the, the 12 social foundations were drawn from the sustainable development goals. The reason for drawing them from the sustainable development goals is that the, the, there's a global agreement, all governments have already agreed that every person in the world has a right 
to live outside of this hole in the donut. So there's very strong international contemporary agreement. And these nine planetary boundaries, as the question was quite right, it's not just climate change and ocean acidification, it's chemical pollution, excessive fertilizer use, excessive water withdrawals from lakes and rivers, land conversion, biodiversity loss, air pollution and ozone depletion. These are the nine planetary boundaries recognized by Earth System scientists in 2009 led by Johan Rockström, Will Steffen, Catherine Richardson, and others. So we're following the latest science on planetary boundaries and following the agreements of governments around the world. So the global donut, this global scale, it comes from those databases, it comes from that latest, and we evolve as they evolve. When it comes to the, the, the local ones, though, it's a really good question. Who decides? Who determines? And as I was saying, we don't try to make them comparable let it be a local conversation of that place who decides what a decent standard of living is there but those planetary ceilings are calculated downwards um, on a global budget i think the metrics that we're using the the parameters we're using the decisions we're making are still very much in the early days so i don't see any of the donuts that are being produced at the moment these are not definitive because there's a lot of ethics behind it there's a lot of missing data, as Camille was clearly saying, we just don't yet have the data. How do we determine the parameters? I, I, and one could get very frustrated by this or say, take the long view. We've had a century of GDP. We have been narrowed to this one financial metric. We've now got to break out from that. And thank goodness we are at the beginning of a data revolution that is going to bring so much metrics that measure life in human and ecological metrics themselves, measuring life in her own terms. So let's keep bringing in new forms of data. We've got blockchain that enables you to find the connections local to global. So I see it rather than get frustrated by the limitations of the data, here we go, we are beginning. We will look back in 10 years and say, oh, look how far we've moved. This is how data and, a, and a, we measure the world differently. We start to measure what we actually care about. I'm, I'm not going to jump and answer all three questions right now. I don't know if Camille or, or Julia want to come in. Um, yes, maybe a few words about the framework that we use at local scale, because as you said, not or every donut is different in any place because people are taking the model and rethinking the model at, um, with their own, especially their own social needs. But um, the question that we have here, well, we, al we also used the, um, we, we really like the human needs theory because it, it helped to, to choose well the, the um, dimensions of the social foundation. But here we used the social quality theory, which is pretty, close to the social human needs uh, theory. But, well, the question is, once we have a theory and a framework, which indicators do we use, and especially what is the target? Who decides the target? Uh, here, we created this working group about the social foundations of Enil because, because we really fe felt that we need to ask to many researchers, but also to the services, technical services of UNIL, and maybe to students and to the whole community, what is the social foundation in UNIL? But if you let just people choose what is important and choosing especially the targets, the question is, how do you ensure that it's not too much, that you don't overshoot the ecological sailing once you have chosen the social targets? So. This is like um, a balance to find, and we don't know yet how to inform properly this um, target choosing process. And well, th th um, I think I can just say maybe a few points about the, the relations between the different indicators, because that's one of the things that um, I've been very interested in for more than 10 years now, oh my god. Uh, but basically, what we see internationally and what we also see at a more local level is that uh, the relation, uh, sadly, the more planetary boundaries you overshoot, as Kate showed in the graph, the more human needs and social indicators you achieve. That's generally the, 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 the pattern when you look at any one moment in time. What's really interesting is that this is not a development trajectory. 
And as things change over time, different countries and different localities are finding new ways to do things. And they're generally improving on things. And we can see a lot of diversity there. So I think there's a lot to learn from the system. When we look also, we, were, we are able to do things like model human need satisfaction at what, what would be how we would achieve universal human need satisfaction, so the social foundation of the donut effectively, while remaining within planetary boundaries using very efficient technologies and very equal distributions. And it turns out that these kinds of things are technically possible. So we see that this relationship is not something that has to be a constraint, but it's definitely something that we have to escape. And we have to escape growth imperatives. We have to escape unequal distributions. Um, uh, and th that becomes the work. So the work becomes how do we invest in a, a, a different technical infrastructure and organizational way of doing things that, uh, that, that is a, a big, big shift from what we're doing right now, including at the university. And um, I know, I mean, I have parents who are at the university. Uh, they flew a lot. I mean, some of my happiest childhood memories are just seeing my father coming back on the plane. You know, we'd go and get him at Geneva Airport. So that's, that's, that's a bit tough to sort of move away from that um, uh, for some people. For other people, it becomes very normal because they realize that on long train trips, they can get papers written. <laughs> can I jump in there on the question about um, how can we see operating within limits not as a constraint, but an opportunity? I think this is really profound question. And I think the greatest opportunity that we each have or that we collectively have to understand the value of limits is to come back to our own bodies. Because within our own body, we understand, first of all, that the health of our body lies in balance. Right. I need food and hell. I need food and uh, warmth and water and exercise, but not infinite amounts of it. Oxygen. I mean, too much of any of these things will kill us. Our body's health lies in balance and our bodies are brilliant at continually finding that balance. Our bodies thrive and we survive because of constraints. So I need food and I need sleep. And these are constraints on my time. I need to sleep every night to be able to operate again the next day. There are constraints of how much I can carry, how long I can stay awake, how much I can healthily eat. There are constraints of need of a minimum of food, of a minimum of water. So the, the dynamism of our bodies, the fact that we endure and survive is thanks to these constraints and our bodies being sensitive to them. So what's the opportunity? The opportunity is, is health. The opportunity of constraints is to survive. And if we can take what we deeply understand in our bodies, that health lies in balance, and take that to the planetary body and understand that health lies in respecting the life-supporting systems of our planetary home, and there are constraints that Gaia doesn't have the same homeostasis that's built into our own body, but we must work together to respect them. The opportunity of that is to actually survive and to thrive. So again, we sometimes think opportunity must show up as growth. No, here opportunity shows up as actually thriving. And I think it's far bigger than growth, but it's a really profound, uh, really profound question of how we reconnect to health is balance. And that is what success looks like. I'm really keen to know if uh, Julia or Camille have a thought on that. Okay, thank you very much for the first answer. Unfortunately, time is running out, but we will still have the opportunity to take three questions in the audience. So there will be two mics that are passing in the public. So just raise your hand and you will have... Okay, I think there is one question here. And... Okay, please ask your question. Thank you very much, Kate. This is very, very interesting. Um, how... Uh, do we actually start changing once we figured out what we need to do? The donut helps us figure out what we need to do. But just opening our mind and getting away from the brainwashing we've had collectively will also allow us to, to see where we need to go. But to change, we need to challenge power in all its forms, from, from governance, finance, property, wh wh whatever. How do we actually do that? Okay, we'll take the second question also. I think I saw one question on the back, yeah. Hello. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm the dean of the business and economics faculty here at the university. And the question I have, actually two questions, is that you mentioned a little bit your relationship with economics. And um, it sounded to me as they were sort of stuck in their old models. And my maybe a little bit provocative question is, is that really the current view? Because I'm not even an economist, but if I talk to my colleague professors, I don't get the impression that they are actually stuck in those old models. So, so could it be that your view is from 10 or 15 years ago and things might also change in economics? And related to that, what is the role of economic scholars uh, for the donut or for your approach? It seems to me that it's a waste of resources if we throw away, you know, decennies of valid or not valid research. So what's your take on that? What's the role or what's the constructive role uh, to bring these two maybe worlds together? Thanks a lot for this question. And maybe a final one I've seen in the middle, a question, yeah? Perfect. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for this really exciting presentation. I think this is very interesting. The question I have is about the inside of the donut, which I think the, the outside I understand quite well, and, and the whole idea about making us into a thriving society is very telling. I think it helps a lot to understand. But the inside, I still struggle a little bit exactly how to understand it, in the sense that when it comes to, to a country or to the, to the, to the world, you refer to the sustainable development goals, it makes sense. I understand how you can reduce this to a smaller scale at the level of a country, of a city, of a, of a, of a neighborhood, perhaps. But when talking about something else, like a research institution, um, are we still talking about the same social goals that we are pursuing? At least, I mean, my, my, both my profession and my personal interest is in how the research system works as an institution, as a... As a as a, as a system that produces knowledge, that produces education and so forth. And I think a commission of a uni university is to produce research, produce uh, knowledge, produce uh, education. Um, my question, in a sense, is does the inside of the donut need to be a reference, in your view, to the, to the model that is the global model? Or should it be a reference to the mission or the own political intention of the institution that does the donut? These are great questions. Shall I, shall I jump in and try and answer? I'll yeah, try please, and... Kate. Okay. Um, to come to the, uh, the, the, the Dean of the Business and Economic School, lovely to meet you. Um, first of all, to answer an earlier question, how can you engage with the donut for business? We have a tool specifically de dedicated for this. It's called Donut Design for Business. And I will tell you very briefly that when companies come to us and say, oh, we want to uh, say that our, uh, we're, we're making products that are in the donut, we think our products are really donut friendly, we actually say very quickly to them, what we think you need to focus on is the deep design of your business. So this is the framework that we use to engage with all companies. Changing the deep design of business itself, we believe, will ultimately change the kinds of products and services that business can create. So that's in very brief the way we engage with business. And I have an excellent colleague, Erinch Sahan, who used to be the CEO of the World Fair Trade Organization, but also used to work for Procter & Gamble. So he's worked across the business spectrum. He's holding that work and doing really interesting work on new enterprise design. That's briefly. I love your provocation. Uh, am I stuck thinking that economics departments are out of date? The way I test this is I talk to students who are currently enrolled in the university. So actually I've given lectures in online and in person in many economics departments. And I always say, put up your hand if you've ever studied economics, please tell me what is the first diagram that you learn. Every single time the room resonates with supply and demand. They are not changing the fundamentals of what's taught to students. And I want to be really clear that for me, it matters hugely what we teach in Econ 101, because most students only study this. So they are given a worldview of economics that puts the market and price at the center of their vision. The economy is never embedded within the living world. It's never seen as a subset of that. We talk about damage to the planet as an environmental externality. To me, this is a profoundly damaging mindset. 
what we teach to students at the beginning shapes the mindset they will carry through their lives. And so sometimes I hear a response as well, you know, you should see the research we're doing or the, uh, the, the advanced research programs. To me, that is not an excuse or good enough reason to keep teaching the next generation who will go from economics to law, to business, to politics, and they will take with them a very outdated mindset. I also have many economic students come up to me and say, I read Donut Economics. I was really excited by it. I'm studying economics at university. This is not what they're teaching me. They are teaching what you called the old way. So for as long as the students keep telling me that they're being taught the old system, I, I think we need to keep challenging economics departments that to change the mindset that goes in our minds. Um, and then just very quickly, how to challenge power. How to challenge power, this is the ultimate question. I think we need an ecosystem of transformation, of organizations, of initiatives that are challenging power. We need people in that ecosystem who are locking onto oil rigs, who are exposing corruption, who are challenging power directly. These are very brave characters who directly face up to power. Some of them are in the room with you now. There are other people who work in the middle of the system very quietly for decades, changing some part of the legal code, the tax code that will ultimately change the power of corporations or change the power of government or enable citizens assemblies to happen, changing the system from within very quietly, massively important too. And then there are other initiatives that will try to build, build a new space because to counter power with an alternative. Donut economics sits in that place. So donut economics is not the way to challenge power at all. I think it takes an ecosystem of change makers. What I hear from those who hold places of resistance is it's really valuable to us that you are holding a new possibility because we can then point to that. Many friends of mine who work uh, very active in Extinction Rebellion say we can't sit only with extinction all the time. We also need to be able to pivot towards what's possible to bring people in. So it's an ecosystem of change. I do not know personally where we, how and where we transform and bring down old power. I'm with all of you in that struggle to try to make that happen. So I'm finding that there's energy drawn towards donor economics and it, it makes sense for me to keep holding this space as part of a much bigger ecosystem of change. I hope that's helpful. Thank you oh, and the last question, sorry, the, the point on the metrics of the social foundation is a really great point. And I think that's exactly why Camille is saying we need to think more about this. What are the metrics of our social foundation here in UNIL? Right. That's a, it's a really, really good question. Are we trying to replicate the global or is it those as they relate to the mission of our organization? These are exactly the kind of questions that arise when you try and take a, a framework that's developed in one context and adapt it for use in another. And this is how we learn together. Thanks a lot. Uh, Julia and Camille, even though the question were not directly addressed to you, would you like to react to some points? Um, I, th I think that the, the, I think Kate's answers were, uh, were very good in how I would uh, also answer. I guess one of the things I would just add to the, to the insight of the donut for the university, we have to remember the university is made of people and I have seen universities where people including myself, were made utterly miserable. I had a little note on how to avoid suicide up on my computer screen during my PhD. That's always fun. Uh, and, uh, and there are universities where people can do great work and are treated uh, well. And I think that that's one of the things that the donut is trying to do, is put people and their well-being at the center of what we're, what we're trying to do here. Um, some of the greatest universities in the world treat their people extremely miserably. And uh, they do not deserve to be great, because they, they're just horrible places. And well, uh, thank you so much for your answers. Uh, maybe just just an idea about um, how to, how do we engage change? Uh, you were talking about we have to try, and maybe the right of experiments is is maybe a precious tool. We have to have some space to try to go far, to to enter the donut, and then to inspire others. So I think that's that's maybe a something to try. Yeah. And, and can I just pick up on that, Camille? That, yeah. that and, and thank you to everyone in UNIL who has made it possible for you and your team to try and to make this experiment and to see where it goes. And thank you to Benoit and everybody else who says, we actually will take this as a compass and start using it, even though it's imperfect, even though it's incomplete. 
but we know it's pointing us in the direction that we need to go. So thank you to all of you for putting the resources, the time, the human thought, the energy into trying, because maybe this is how we face power. We try. We make initiatives and we see what happens and we learn and we learn and we keep trying. Okay, and the event is coming to an end, but before the acknowledgement and further announcement, Kate, I wanted exactly to give you the opportunity to, to say a final word. You just did, but what is your takeaway message for the audience in a few words? My takeaway message is thank you for your initiative. It's going to have resonance far beyond your university. It's really clear to see and impressive how you've taken a concept of the page You've brought intellect, you know, you've brought the intellectual skills of the university to have impact on your own university. Here's to many more universities doing that. You've married intellectual impact and, and thought with actually a commitment to putting it into practice, as Benoit so eloquently spoke. How do we now do this? You've connected it to a far more deliberative form of democracy. So it's a beautiful connection of intellectual leadership actually turn that into practice and facing the challenge. It's not pretty to look at your own overshooting donut, I'm sure, but you are so much further ahead than an uh, institution that won't even look at it. You are on the road. And then to bring a democratic process to it, you're showing us different ways of deciding. And I know the ripples are going to come far. So I can't wait for this to be shared more and more widely. And let's see what you will learn back also, right? You will learn back from other institutions who say, thank you for this incredible foundation. You've done that much work. It gave us space to do this additional work and you might want to incorporate what we've done. That's what we uh, are thrilled by time and time again, the, the insights that others have. This is the work of many. I always say this is big team work. And so it's a, an honor to be working with you as part of this big team of, of wide transformation following the journey. I think we are starting to get emotional. Um, <laughs> again, thank you for your final words and a big thank you for your time and your insight, the insight you have shared with us today. It was a pleasure and an honor to receive you. And a huge thank thanks so to Julia for leading this panel discussion, to Camille and Benoit for the crucial inputs on the work done here at UNIL. We would like, we would like to sincerely thank Jacques Dubochet for making this event possible and for this whole series on sustainability that you have brought to life. It is truly a great gift to all of us, so very much thank you. Of course, none of it would have been possible without our wonderful colleagues at UNICOM and at the Competence Center in Sustainability, and in general, uh, the direction of the University of Lausanne that is pushing the envelope on that subject and making it possible. So thank you again to all of you. And we ex also extend our thanks to all the people who make sure this room is always neat and tidy. Your work is essential and it is truly appreciated. And before we officially close this event, I would like to make two final announcements. First, we will have the great pleasure of welcoming Thomas Piketty, a French economist and author of multiple seminal books in October of this year for the next event of the Jacques Dubochet series. And second, everyone who registered today online or here will receive an email containing a few summary of the discussion we had today. Thanks to all of you who attended today in person or online, and thank you for your excellent question. It, w it has been an absolute pleasure for you and me to moderate this session. Have a beautiful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.